it's a pleasure to welcome Marcus Hawthorne to the show. Marcus is a man from the British Legion, and we're here to talk a little bit about VE Day. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here, would we, in person? So, Marcus, uh, com- uh, welcome to the show. It's a real pleasure to have you here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. And you're from the British Legion. Yes, area manager for the North, which means North Eastern Cumbria, Tees Valley. And yes, and you're here because on Sunday it's the anniversary again. It is. Yeah. Of VE Day. We we. We marked the 70th anniversary last year with some major national events. I remember seeing yeah, it on the telly. Led yeah, by yeah. Um, the Queen and other dignitaries down in London. Yeah. Um, but, of course, every year is the anniversary of, of the end of the Second World War course, in Europe. Of course, of course. And, you know, it's quite a remarkable day. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, a very important conflict across the world for this country and many others. So wow, lots course. of sacrifice by families at home as well as those that served... Um, overseas, so yeah. very important that we mark. I mean, I have nothing, nothing but respect for them, all the people, and even you know, and, and, and the inhabitants of Britain who suffered the war. Not only the people who were at war, the people who lived in the countries. That anything that anybody had to do with that terrible time, that intense time, I just have complete respect for them. I mean, my granddad was actually in the Second World War for six years. He was in uh, India. Yeah. And, you know, he volunteered straight away. It's just a thing you did. He went there, he did it, and uh, never really talked about it that much. Yeah, and the, the paradox of the VE Day event, though, or, or the day, if you like to mark it, is the mixed feelings. You mm-hmm. have that feeling of euphoria and relief that the war in Europe right. was over. Yeah, but it was but still... But, of course, yeah. people like your grandfather it was still, it was still and, and hundreds of thousands yeah, of others of were still fighting in Burma. Of course. And that war went on, or that conflict went on till August, you yes. know, and still yeah. horrible things happened um, in conflict. Yeah. And there's all the Far Eastern prisoners of war oh, who were yeah. existing in terrible conditions. In terrible so conditions, yeah. you have this relief at the end of the war in Europe, yeah. but still the thought... Mm. That there's many a lot of Americans there. there as well. Yeah, in, time, and yeah. and in the Pacific and so on. Mm. But also at home, those who lost family members mm. or had family members come home injured and badly affected by the by, by the wars. Um, so very much mixed feelings on the 8th of May 1945. Very much mixed feelings. It's just lovely and I think really important though that we, that we never forget. Like it says on the, a lot of the war memorials, I actually live, live opposite a war memorial in Thorny. It says lest we forget and we yeah. should never forget. Yeah. You know, uh, how many, how, when, when 1945, what is it now, 2000, so how many years, 70 odd 71 years? 71 years. 71 years. Year, I mean, that's yeah. nothing really. Yeah. In the annals of history. But, I mean, we should always remember. And, obviously, you know, each each anniversary that happens and when we celebrate it, obviously, the people who were there, like my granddad and stuff, I mean, he passed away three years ago. He lived a long, long life. But, obviously, there's less and less of them now mm. to actually... So we can celebrate with yes. them because, yeah. obviously, people get old. Yeah. You know. I mean, you can't predict when, when the last... I mean, it's inevitable all those that survived will pass on at some point. Well, every... Yeah, But exactly. you can't predict when the last one will go. No. And, and, um, it's you know, very nice, though, isn't it, when you see them there, yeah, the old yeah, soldiers, the ones yeah. who were actually there, get, getting the, you know... Just the love, really, for want of a better word, and the thank you and the respect yeah, for I mean, what they've done for us. Last year, the um, French awarded... Um, all our D-Day survivors, yeah. you know, those, those that were part of the D-Day invasions, awarded all our um, D-Day survivors with the Legion d'honneur, the highest, the highest award. Thing, yeah, yes. So I was able to be there where a number of people across the area oh, that's fantastic. had their Legion d'honneur and presented. Went, oh, wow. I mean, there, was so, there were many, many people. You can't go to them all. And no, of course not. You, we don't necessarily know them all either, no, no, you know, no. personally. So I went to um, a couple in Newcastle, a couple in Carlisle, in Darlington, there was one, and there's such warmth and affection. That must for have been a beautiful thing for you, that. Yeah. And, oh, well, they're lovely people as well. They've course, got they've yeah. got such gentleness in their in their in their old age, if you yeah, like, yeah, and, yeah. and the, the memories and their respect for humanity and so on just comes through. And yeah. it's great to see people like that recognised yeah. for for everything they put in. Yeah. But the one thing that struck me about all of them actually is it is in the course of the ceremony where they were given this award they all made comments about how sad they still felt about the comrades they'd lost yes all Not, these years ago all, all those years ago still it still stayed with them you know it's you know being in conflict and in combat with your fellow man builds yeah. bonds that um you know even today the soldiers 
uh, you know, servicemen and women who who've served in Afgar- Afghanistan and Iraq most recently, mm. they still have those bonds with the people they served with, and they yeah. will stay with them forever. And mm. it's remarkable that these um, mainly men who were given the uh, award of the Legion d'Honneur last year remember their comrades That's and the comrades they had for them. Been. Yes, I mean because obviously it's for the it's for the ones who died as well more than anything, you know, and th- they really yes. and as well I suppose it's very nice for these heroes, you know, who got the Legion d'Honneur, these heroes, I suppose it's really nice for their families as well to be there and to feel so proud of them. Yes. And it's a big day out yeah. for all because it runs down through generations and generations and hopefully those little grandkids and great grandkids there, uh, so they know about it. I mean, I'd like it, to, I don't know what the situation is in uh, schools, but I'm a big believer that, you know, schools and young children should be always kind of, you know, not instilled in them in like a very, you know, dogmatic way, but just, you know, taught them, you know, effectively of like what happened in our recent history and what your great granddad or your granddad might have had to go through and went through and all these heroes yeah. that actually made Britain the easy place it is and the, the great place it is now for the likes of us to walk around. Yeah, I mean, you the, know. the thing that's easy for um, people who just give our remembrance activities as a, as a country, a passing glance. Yeah. The, it's easy for them to think, oh, this is a national thing. Well, actually, it's not a national thing. It's a community thing. It's a community thing. Yeah, yeah. The, it was the communities that lost yeah. sons and daughters. All the young sons it's and daughters. It's the communities yeah. whose children at school are thinking about whether they're, you know, one or more of their parents is going to come back. Yeah. It's the communities that were affected by aerial bombardment. Yeah. It yeah. was a communities like in Hartlepool, for example, yeah. that were affected by bombardment from the sea during the First World War. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so it goes on. Yeah. And that's where our remembrance is anchored. And one mm. of the, you know, the Legion is, um, if you like, the, the custodian of remembrance mm. for the country. Uh, one of the things we do as a, in part of that role, every year we produce packs for schools All right, great. to provide them with resources and materials and information that the teachers can use to do lesson plans or projects or whatever, Yeah, try and incorporate them into the various key stages of education mm. to bring to life for the children there mm. the way in which their communities contributed yeah, to yeah, yeah. A, the conflict, but through that, the future of our country. Yeah, you know, it's very much anchored in the roots of the community. Yeah, yeah, and how strong the community can be yeah. under such extreme yeah. situations, kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, obviously, th- them times are nothing like today, and kids kids won't be able to understand that, and we we, we, we we wouldn't want to fill them with shock horror. But they need to know that things were a lot different. And yeah. It was uh, yeah pretty damn tough. Yeah, you know, and what that's I mean? just and that's just the Second World War we're talking about. Yeah, we're, yeah, you mean, know, this, we're not even going. We're, we're not even delving into the First World War, are yeah. we? The not, horrors of that. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But obviously you do things with the First World War as well. Well, this the year it, it's a big one because it's the centenary of the Somme battle. Well, it, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, 141 days of the I mean, I remember battle. two years ago it was very big, the start of it all. Yeah, exactly. And, and we're marking in different ways each of the key... Um, battles that UK, you know, British forces were involved in. Yeah. Of course, the other thing that we mustn't forget is that when we talk about British forces in those days, both the Second World War and the First World War, huge numbers of what we now call Commonwealth countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, you know, troops from uh, Africa, from the Indian subcontinent. Yes. Yeah. And when we, when we talk about the Indian subcontinent, we don't mean India. We mean what is now India, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, maybe even yeah, yeah Thailand. Of all, yeah, yeah. All, all of those, all of those people yeah. sent battalions to yeah. fight alongside UK British. I mean, we probably and wouldn't have won if it, if it wasn't for them numbers that helped us. I mean, no, I was, I was looking up um, some of the stats for the. Um, Statistics can be boring, but they can also tell a tell a story. Sure, sure. And that the 14th Army, which was the the main part of the Burma Army, right, was something like 75 percent Indian Army. Wow, you yeah, know, yeah, a yeah. lot. I mean, you would probably want it to be because it's that yeah. climate that they were more used to, and well, the of climate course. They, of course. They, they were used to. But yeah, nevertheless, it does indicate the scale of commitment. There. And it would be nice for people when we come com- com- when we commemorating all these soldiers and stuff, it'd be nice for people to think about, you know, yeah. the, these people yeah. from other places yeah. in the world who actually yeah. contributed as well. well we, you know, we, it, it's a well-known um, political both, uh, political uh, point locally and nationally as to how um, 
immigrants from the Indian subcontinent are integrated in communities and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Part of that, and obviously that's uh, you know a challenge for resources and schools and how you bring people into communities and how you make all of that work. But part of that, we mustn't forget, they are part of our, or their ancestors are part of our historical yeah. and, and war fighting tradition. And, of course, and they, yeah. they have that same history, that same legacy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Of course, of course. Even though a few hundred years before that, we actually went there and, and then the British Raj and everything. But that's, yes, that's yeah. a different story. That becomes it? history as opposed that's to a, remembrance. That's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's history. Yeah. We, we produce, as I said, we help um, schools and communities each year with more information resources about different parts of the whole remembrance thing. Yeah. Uh, and this year we've um, produced toolkits, which are free, mm. to help people with s the Somme centenary, right. first of all, and the Battle of Jutland as well, right. the naval, main naval, the naval battle. one, yeah. And um, they're all free, but we, I think the target was to ship out a 1,000 of these. Right. That was our sort of fairly modest target. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know what the absolute figure is now, but we have shipped out thousands Fantastic. Not a ships thousand. out as in what? To what well, people go online right, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to um, I, yeah, sorry, so, you know, metaphorically shipped yeah, out, yeah, as in yeah, posted yeah. out to people. Yeah. People go online, British Legion website, Royal British Legion website, and order their own toolkit yeah. for an event. These are not souvenir things. You're yeah. supposed to be running an event yeah. to commemorate the, the battle, mm. uh, either one, and the SOM toolkit will, ge will be sent out to you. We yeah. wanted to send out a thousand yeah yeah but we've we've sent out thousands wow yeah yeah and, that, and good, we haven't right? even started yet july the first is the onset of the Somme centenary um, events nationally and yeah. locally yeah and um the they'll run until november the 18th so 141 days yeah and in that time will the toolkits will still be there and i yeah. encourage anyone who's listening who wants to run a local event in yeah. any any point in that period to mark um, losses in their community sure. to send away. We could maybe pack. do something on the radio about yeah, that, could. Get something specific about it. And, and I was talking about the community a minute ago and how it's the community that suffered the losses and, and, and so on. And because what you mentioned much. at the start of the show, it's basically all related to how yeah. this affects the community, yeah. not yeah, just absolutely. the soldiers who were there, what it means back home and everything. And if you think about how recruiting happened, after the initial surge of getting the, the, the reservists and the army that we had in place at the beginning of the first war, world war after that you've got a massive surge in what's known as kitchener's army right yeah, so it was basically a bunch of guys who and they were all guys at this point um you know who worked together all joined up together right and they formed what's known as the pals battalions right these are all people who worked together or were mates Right. So you have entire These four. weren't regular soldiers no, or anything. What was no. it because they were older or something? They like left. Or? No, simply because we didn't need the numbers. Oh, we didn't need the numbers and anymore. We couldn't mobilise them quickly enough. Okay, right. right so right. we used the initial regular forces and reservists for the first year and a half right. of First World War. But then it became clear we needed more, and Kitchener planned to recruit yeah. a conscription. Yeah. And the, and the first of this, uh, and they became known as the Pals Battalions. Right. So you had entire football clubs yeah, being yeah. mobilised. You yeah, had... Yeah. Um, I've heard about that, all, yeah. all, all the guys of a particular age group from a, a type of industry, um, like, I don't know, the Butcher's Brigade or mm. whatever, you yeah, know, yeah, from, yeah. from London. They'd all, fought, all join up together. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and they fought together. And, of course, in the case of the Somme, Many of them died together, but these are all people who worked with each other, came from the same part of the country, same town, same village sometimes. Yeah. And so, again, you know, the, the, the contribution, the commitment, and then ultimately the sacrifice and the loss is felt in the community. Of course, of course. And that's why it's so important that... Um, and even though I mean, market there. you know, it's one of the most terrible things of humanity, if not the most terrible thing of humanity, isn't it, war? Especially when it's mass war. But yet, in such a dark thing, how the community can blend together and like, the good things can come out of it. But, you know, Marcus, are we learning from it? I mean, you know, we, we, speak, we speak in heady days of war, don't we? I mean, they're not really, it's not on our doorstep. But look, just look at the Middle East and stuff. I mean, it seems to me <laughs> that humans never, never really learned that. I mean, they said after the First World War, didn't they? Never again. And look what happened. You know, how, yeah. long, how long is it from the First World War to the Second World War? You've got that Treaty of Versailles. Oh, yeah, big pompous men. Never again, never again. I mean, the, 20 years later, the, it's, ba the, it's, ba it's back on. The, the, the role of the British Legion is to mark 
the sacrifice of those yeah, of course, of course. Who, who have made that commitment. Oh, of course. Had, you know, suffered a lot. Oh, this is no fault of them, of course. They're the, the victims, the and, innocents. You know, the, the matter of whether we learn from previous wars, whether we go to war again, whether pre- previous wars were right or not right, yeah. that's something for politics. That's something for politics. And we well, I, I do think it's very important, getting back to the, yeah. the, the children, the, educating the children about the horrors of war as well. That can only be yes. good. To put their, you know, viewpoint yes. in a way of like, well, yeah. look how lucky we are now. Isn't peace so much better? Well, I mean, there's two, there's two sides to that. One is um, we need to understand that our forebears gave up a lot so that we could live no, like we course, do now. Of course, of course. But the second one is, a, is an interesting one. It's not, it's not d- discussed very often, but that is if you are in um, a fight for your life yeah. individually or as a community, or as a society, um, you may be forced to do some really quite terrible things to defend yourself. Exactly. And um, in those days, albeit the strings and the control of everything that happened is in the hands of politicians and generals, just because of the way society was configured, nevertheless, if you are up against someone who um, will willingly give up their own life to take yours... It can, how far are you prepared to go to defend yourself? And you've got to ask yourself, as not personally, but as a society. These poor people, people who've given up their lives for the likes person. of me, I've got nothing but complete respect, and I, well, I'm, I'm down on my knees. Yeah, but if we're threatened as a country no, or as a society, yeah. there is a point where everyone w- would need to start thinking. Well, how far are we? Yeah, prepared to go to defend what we have. Of course, of course. I mean, and, and as well, you know, I think comparisons, that cliche that are odious, I think they're very odious when comparing different wars, for example. I mean, I don't think the First World War and the Second World War, we could put them two together in the sense of, you know, national, national, national fear and national, you know, to lose our nationality, to lose yeah. our integrity yeah. as a people. Mm. You know, you can't compare them with things in Iraq and Afghanistan, I don't think. I don't want to get into that, but you know, I think the Second World War and the First World War, they stand on their own yeah. as the, the likes of, you know, standing to defend the threat that you perceive on your country. For me, that's total yeah. threat. But and it, as we're talking about them boys from the first, them men, them brave men, them brave warriors from the Second World War specifically with the VE Day, I just want to make it clear, like for me, them are just heroes 100%. Yeah. And of course, we, know, to do with we know, we know far more about what happened to our um, men and women in uniform in Afghanistan and Iraq because of the way information is Media available. and stuff like uh, that. Exactly. Course, course, and also course. people's own accounts. People will yeah. write home. They'll come home with photographs and whatever yeah. and tell their story. Second World War, it was not anywhere near that. So actually... Mm. The, the 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 scale and depth of some of the experiences will possibly never be told. Yeah, it's um, funny. You know, I was just reading yesterday, linked with the war. Oh, I've got a terrible memory. I forgot her name, but I was just she's just died recently. One of the uh, heroes of the French Resistance, a French lady, and it was uh, I was reading her in the Times about her uh, funeral and everything, and she was uh, one of these radio operators, French, trained in Britain, just like the famous one. But this was one of the last ones, and it was what she did, and she was so brave, and she was captured once, tortured, never give them anything of information, mm-hmm. went back to England, trained more, went back with this French resistance, this French lady, and, you know, she's just passed away, sadly. And, you know, Guillaume, I'm rubbish at friends, somebody Guillaume she was called, G-U-I-L-L-O-N, Madame Guillaume, and just reading her story, what a lady, what a brave lady, you know, the things, it just it just personifies really the things on, on an in, individual human basis, what people actually do for their country and for their people. You know, like all of the people in the Second World War and the First World War. And it was just amazing. You look at it sometimes, and sometimes I get a bit on my high horse, you know. I look at these things, like I read that obituary yesterday of her, and I was just, I, there's tears in my eyes, really, really, of like, what a hero, what a, what a lady, what a person, what a human being. And then all of a sudden, like, I walk out and there's Celebrity Big Brother or something. And it's like, what a contrast in societies and humans. I mean, I'm not slagging off human beings here, by the way, but sometimes I see a big contrast in, in like, uh, you know, things like dignity and humility and character and just a bit of, you know, the good things about how humans can be. You know what I mean? Well, at the same time as the, as, at the, same time as the TV is playing out whatever game you know, shows yeah. or reality shows you want to mention, um, you know, we've got, uh, with others, we've put the uh, a team out into... Uh, the United States for the Invictus Games. 
Which is a great so thing. I watched got, that last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So great, great, yeah. great bunch of guys. No, we've yeah, got several yeah. people from up, up here in, in in my area who we know quite well and who've gone along. Yeah. Um, one of the guys, uh, a chap called Gareth Golightly, he's in. I think he's selected for three sports: basketball, archery, and, and one other. He won our Armed Forces Champion Award last year, which we sponsored wow. with the Chronicle up in uh, up in Newcastle. Yeah. So that was really good. It's really great to see these people go out. And y- you look at, and you might view negatively some of the um, motivations behind reality TV and watching game shows or whatever. But when you see these guys and what they're prepared to do, mm. uh, and, and Gareth is a good example because he has a family. He's completely dedicated to the future of his family, his kids, his yeah. wife and whatever. Yeah. Um, and the things he's prepared to do yeah. to keep his life together, to move on, to better himself, to, to set an example for his kids, yeah, yeah. prepare a future for them, yeah. is just fantastic. But he wasn't on Celebrity Big Brother. No, I'm, even if he was, I, I wouldn't. Really hope not. Even if he, no, even if he was, I wouldn't slag him off. I mean, if they put me on for a week to get some money out of it, I might do it, and I'd put the money to good use. But yeah, you're talking about the Invictus Games. And yeah, stuff. yeah, I'm talking yeah. people, people who, who, um, people like those who compete in the Invictus in Games. Yeah. Because there are many who were not selected, of course, and they they've got to obviously in the same way as if you don't get picked for the Olympic team, you've got to pick yourself up and move on and do other things, you know. Invictus Games, Prince Harry, yeah. he's doing a great thing. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. seems to be really. He seems to have took yeah. to this uh, Invictus thing with a real passion. You can see it when he speaks. Well, he's. I mean, he's a natural leader, clearly, he is, but yeah, because yeah, he's yeah. served, he has something in common well, with that, these guys. You, you see the empathy with him, especially when he's talking about the soldiers and anything to do with. Yeah. That. And not just the empathy. The, well, yeah, the empathy and the love. He's really into it, and it's a great thing. Yeah. But the Royal British Legion has provided all the sort of pastoral and welfare support for the Brits out there. So Fantastic. We've got a team of um, people out there helping, supporting them, and the families that have gone out. Not all the families have gone out, I don't think, but those that have, we're there to help and support them. Did, he got. It was an American idea at first, wasn't it? The Americans did it. Or is that me just I being a bit ignorant? I, I, and he's seen it and wanted to take it a bit further. Isn't it? Did, I, you got the idea from there, or is that? May, just, may, I think they had to. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if the Americans had the idea first. He might have seen first. something and thought we and can we, make this bigger. And we've done our own here, bigger and better. Yeah. And then we've brought it together. I think in the states. Yeah. So, but I'm not an authority on that, its, its origins. Yeah. But it is a great thing. It just shows what our service men and women are prepared to do. And the way I heard Prince Harry, I don't know where it was. It might have been on the radio the other day, speaking about the the main point of all this is for when you're you know you're looking at someone who's been injured a soldier, yeah, and normally before their injury, they're very capable, you know, physically and mentally, you know, and this injury can, you know, they uh, it can bring them right down mentally. So the, a lot of this Invictus Games thing, as he was eloquently putting it, is to kind of, you know, I can do that, yeah. no matter what their yeah. ailment is or their yeah. injury is, to get them back that confidence of, yeah. you know, feeling strong and that they can yeah. do it. yeah. In, and not just like despondent yeah. because every good soldier I suppose likes a good challenge what, it's bringing the physical element yeah as one well of the things it. that we are con- very conscious of um, and it's moving away now from remembrance into how we support the people who, who have come back from conflict mm. with some detriment whether it's a physical injury or, or mm. mental or suffering mental, yeah. or their families have suffered as a result of marital breakdown whatever it mm. happens to be is there's a, a huge range of capacity to recover yeah. in, in veterans and the guys and girls that you see on the Invictus Games, they're the ones who have got enough physical capacity to regain fitness and competitive edge to compete, Yeah, they're not all like that No, and of course they're also the ones who are of an age where that physical uh, fitness can come back to them mm. um, and of course the Royal British Legion deals with veterans of all ages, Great. of yeah. all conflicts, of, of all conflicts, yeah, and you know, from from the moment they are eligible mm. f- for our support, i.e., seven days um, paid service, mm. right the way till they die, and then their families beyond that, yeah, um, and indeed their carers. So we we provide support for all of them. There's a huge range of capacity to cope and to recover. And you know, some of the the, the are we talking a lot of people, aren't we? Well, no. No one really knows. The exact amount. No. We, we know who we have on our books, who we help, and have helped in the past. Because we yeah. don't have a, 
it's not like everyone comes to us and they're permanently on our books. No, of course. The point is to put them back on their exactly. feet, give them home life, stable family, yeah. uh, and, a, and a job, and all that sort of thing, yeah. so they can become independent and stay independent. That's the aim. But we do have people that keep coming back because mm. they fall by the wayside again, can't manage. Um, but the, the main concern for us is those that don't come forward. The forgotten ones, because well, they're, not known, they're not known ones. They're not yeah. known, because there's a number of reasons. Mm. First of all, they may not have had very much service. Right. And it may have been a long time ago, in which case they've really forgotten that they're veterans. Yeah. It, it's not part of their makeup. No. Um, then there are those who've had a bad experience in the forces. Yeah. Either they were you know, asked to leave because they weren't suitable, or um, they were asked to leave because... By whatever quirk, and they might think they wouldn't be eligible for it. But you're going to say, "Of course you are." Yeah, exactly. No matter what happens, but they might have been asked to leave because there's too many in that age group that are like redundancy type things. Sure, sure. Which they, they'll feel resentful of. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then others, of course, have, have may have had a bad operational experience and want nothing more to do with any memory to do with the forces. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there are all sorts of people in, in those sorts of categories who who don't want to or don't think of themselves as veterans and so won't come forward and say look we need help they may well go to a GP but when they're asked you know, have you served they won't offer up that in no. information so sometimes people just won't have no idea at exactly. all. and if you've got no idea exactly. they can't get the help well they can get statutory help mm. but if like, they don't want it how they, are you going to get to them they, c- they can get statutory help like anyone can mm. but what they can't get is um, more advantageous treatment where their yeah. injury is due to service yeah. because of the armed forces cover of which they will be entitled to exactly um, or access to the service charities it would be a real shame if, if in some cases they're not getting this help because they didn't even know it was out there but I think now the way you guys are going the British Legion it's very well marketed to the pu- publicised yeah. it? a, helps a, out a lot of it is about around remembrance and yeah. getting people to be generous which they sure. are phenomenally generous yeah. But we've also got to, you know, match that with telling people what we do and how we help. And what we can, and all the different things yeah. we, you can do. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so, for example, my team, my welfare team uh, that operate across the north, yeah. we um, provide help with all sorts of things. But we start, for example, with routine things around um, supporting people with debt. Right. Whether that's, uh, and obviously there's assessments involved in this. We don't just... It's not yeah. just a queue, queue here for money, here's the money, off you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are assessments. We do go through and help people try and sort things out without that's, going to bankruptcy. That's like another that, topic I was just going to highlight on sometimes, you know, because it happened to a friend of mine who was a soldier for, I think, 15, 16 years, served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now he's doing fine. He's a paramedic in Australia. It suits him down to the ground. Yeah, yeah. But for a few years when he left the army, not that long ago, he found it really hard getting a half-decent job. And yeah. I'm only saying half-decent. Yeah. I'm not saying he was ever realistically comparing anything to the days when he was in the army. But, I mean, he w- he went on a bit of a downer because he was getting, like, not very good. And he was so experienced. He was in Iraq, in Afghanistan. He was in charge, or second in charge of a prison or something. Had a lot of uh, life skills that you yeah. could, yeah. you know. And he... Obviously, it was the recession and stuff like that. But getting back to the point, after highlighting my, my friend, a lot, I know a lot of servicemen and women, when they come out, and they're still obviously young and need to work and stuff, it's getting that, the employment and the right kind of job for them. I see that as quite difficult to a lot of people. It is, and there's lots of things at play there. One is they don't know how to translate what their experience is into the language of the civilian workplace. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, they're not confident that their skills will transfer because mm-hmm. they, there's a bit of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, most of them won't have had a job interview before. No, right, apart from the army. Well, apart from getting into the army, but, yeah, but once you're in, you don't get job interviews. No. You, you sort of talk no. to people about what job you should do yeah, next. Yeah, it's different, isn't And it? you're manoeuvred into course, it, or yeah. you're not given any choice yeah. and you're sent. You of know? course, yeah. So when you leave, especially, and the longer you're in, the worse it is, yeah. you come out and suddenly you're faced with, hang on, I've got a job interview, how do I prepare? Of and then you do that, yeah, yeah. you think you've done your very best and you reject it. Well, how do I cope with rejection? Yeah. So there's all sorts of there's things at play there. complex. And then you, are, you, you go home and, you, and your wife or your kids say, Daddy, did you get the job? Oh, it's going to be another downer, yeah. Yeah, so all of those things come and then to you're gonna start fe- then, the, then they're going to start feeling maybe, you know, less than the worth yeah. for no reason. Then, not nice thought. Yeah, I can understand it being a bit of a... 
yeah, a dig to the confidence and stuff like that, yeah. especially from being in a in an environment before where they are so kind of needing to be very able physically and mental. Yeah. I mean, to be in the army, it's able. You need to be physically very able and mentally, of course. Yeah, and and the yeah. other services, you know, the, the, you know, the army is the, the biggest and very often in the forefront of people's minds. But yeah. of course, the air force and of the course. navy in the, are in the same boat. Yeah, yeah. No pun intended. No, there's a guy who was in the Falklands. He was there. Yeah, right. The Falklands, okay. Yes. yes. And, and the 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 uh, the thing we have to be clear on is most people are fine. You yeah, ask the question sure. about how many th- there are. Yeah, yeah. Well, most yeah. Of, most of the veterans are absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. They've adjusted. May have mm. had a bit of. Uh, I mean, I served, and I in my first six months, um, I had to adjust to not being what I was. And you know, it must it, have been a bit. It was. It was a bit know, weird. It was tricky and weird at some yeah. at some points. So I'm I'm very lucky. I've got. Um, fantastic family around yeah, me yeah. stuck with me and and all of that sort of thing and and helped me through that and it was never really there's never really any crisis but you were one of the majority you know, that you see and you were kind of fine exactly but, but you still have is. to go through that adjustment everybody and yeah. some people go through that adjustment not very well and yeah. it becomes a step down and that gets worse yeah. so what we have to try and do is the royal british Legion is get the message out mm. through whatever means we can whether it's the um, the very public marketing, whether it's through events, whether it's through TV, radio, community radio, such as this, we'll do anything we can. It to help is, is to get the message out to yeah. people who are veterans or who know veterans who need some sort of leg up. Yeah, it might only be a a, a visit. Yeah. It doesn't have to be anything... I'll start just mentioning it on my show every time. Yeah. I can always snip it in. You it, know, it's is easily to, done. It's to get in touch with the Legion. Yeah, especially with it being VE Day on yeah. Sunday. Yeah. The Legion has a contact centre number. Right. Which what, What's that, Mark? If anyone phones it, that, you yeah. get access to any of our support. Yeah. It's 08080280. Right. And as well, they can just get on on the people internet these days and everything. They can easily just get that on the internet, can't they? British Legion, Royal British Legion website has all the information on there that you could possibly want, including that number. Yeah. If you get to the website, the number is visible. Now, so listen, all you people out there who might need this, don't hesitate to look into it if you're interested. As Marcus is saying, all the information's out there. Marcus, so on Sunday then, the highlight of it all, I suppose, for this year, it's the uh, annual event again. Uh, what are you doing? Are you doing anything on this? Where will you be? What will you be? Um, well, I'm not doing anything for VE Day this year. Right, right. The Legion tends to pick the key anniversaries, because if we did every anniversary every year, yeah, yeah. then of course you'd be doing the SOM every year. Yeah, it would go on. So, yeah, you could, so we'd pick yeah. and choose. Yeah. So this year, the events that the Legion is, is um, marking particularly... Uh, is Jutland and the Somme. Jutland and the Somme, right. Yeah, yeah so it's the centenary. Both first world war, both first the world war things. Um, and uh, obviously then later on in the year, it'll be normal Remembrance Sunday and, and Armistice Day. Of course, of course. Um, but, you know, for those who uh, have personal connections yeah. to the Second World War and VE Day, mm. we all have um, grandparents, mm some of whom uh, would have died in the Second World War, certainly yeah. affected by it, Definitely. some served through it. It's still a personal connection. It's, well, it, let's, let's, let's highlight on a, an individual, me, for example, yeah? I never met the man, but uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, my grandma's yeah. dad, he was a sniper in the First World War, and he was right. a prisoner of war. And he came back home after about three or four years in a prisoner of war. He died very young. My, my nana always used to say he was always very nervous and so he was very yeah. mentally affected yeah. by it. So this affects everybody. Yeah. Of course. Well, my grandfather was a padre in the Second World War. A padre, War. wow. Where, where, if I may ask, whereabouts? He, he served in North Africa with in the North 8th Africa, Army. Right. With, with the 8th Army. He was the padre for the Royal East Kent Regiment. Wow. Who were destroyed in a battle in, I think, January or February 1941. Mm. And they were all killed. He was, the, he was there. He was the padre. Uh, he, they were all killed or captured out of, you know, something like 1,100 men. Um, they were all killed or captured apart from 80 people. And those 80 walked out through the desert um, the back models. to UK, back to British lines. Now, I, I don't quite, I don't think the regiment was reformed in its original state. Obviously not with the same people, but in, no. a, in its original form. But that experience lived with him 
for the rest of his Thereafter, life. Thereafter, he, could, he did went you, home Did you meet him? I only knew him for a few years. Just for I, a few you know, years when, when, you, when you were very young. Yeah. Um, he, um, he went home for a bit, then came back, rejoined the 8th Army, mm. and then fought through the war. Wow. Now, VE Day for him yeah. and for my father's family mm. um, was, on the one hand, yes, you know, Dad my granddad might come home. Mm. But actually, he was in Italy with the 8th Army when the war ended. Mm. He served on for another year and a half in Italy. Right. Helping yeah. settle down what was going on in Italy, mm. help administer pastoral and spiritual care to the forces out there. Yeah. And it's worth remembering that, um, even though we talked earlier about th- those in the Far East, a lot of the troops who were in Northwest Europe at the end of the war were shipped out to other parts of the globe and not ah, sent home no afterwards yeah just get yeah. on with it next yeah. step next leg yeah. yeah I think the the official title for the British army in, in North West Europe was the British Liberation Army mm. and that became uh, that turned into Burma looms ahead oh my god yeah because I've just said it's not as if you would imagine everybody that's it war over no. sorry for you young man step two phase two yeah. you're off to Burma or wherever yeah. Yeah. So my grandfather was demobilised in 1946. Yeah. Yeah. Went yeah. home, and um, you know, basically f- lived out the remaining 20 years of his life as an alcoholic, and oh. died in his 50s. And you know, a lot of that was probably to do with the. Ex- the oh, it was all to do with that terrible experience. It was all to do with that. Just tragic, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely yeah. tragic. Yeah. But anyway, on, but onto a lighter note as we're finishing off now. For all the the, the veterans out there from any war, from any time, yeah, not even from a war. People who've served, that's what the yes, absolutely. About. The help's there for yeah. them, yeah. if they can get it. And we connect with all the other service charities as well, so yes. SAFA and Combat Stress, so a very great, close working relationship with them as a well. A great point to start with for any kind of information yeah. is the Royal British Legion. Yeah, absolutely. They're the ones that can put you on the right way, hopefully. Yeah. 08, 08, 80, 2, 80, 80. Marcus, we've had Marcus Hawthorne here. It's been a lovely talk. Thank you very much, Marcus. It's, been, it's been a real pleasure.